topic tonight is empathy. So, I thought for fun, we could kick off, uh, well, at least my part of the evening, with a short empathic exercise, all of us. And I want us to imagine putting ourselves into the shoes or the sandals of today's global poor. So, imagine we're wearing this young woman's shoes. Um, we're not in the countryside, we're not in the village, we're in the city, we're in a slum, we're in a slum like this one. We lost, as Warren Buffett called it, the ovarian lottery. He says, I've had it so good in this world, you know, the odds were 50 to 1 against me being born in the United States in 1930. I won the lottery the day I emerged from the womb <laughs> by being in the United States instead of in some other country where my chances would have been way different. That's the ovarian lottery. So think about it. With a little less luck in the womb, we could very well have taken our first breaths in a place where there's no electricity, no running water, no sanitation, uh, no personal security. So imagine that reality for a minute. See it. Breathe the smoke from the cooking fires and the stoves. Smell the garbage pit festering just over there, the run of the open sewer. Hear the dogs barking and the babies crying and feel the drip of the rain through your tin roof. Feel the fear as a group of young, drunk men walk past your, your, your tin shed. Feel it. Now, I want you to picture somebody from the West showing up in your slum and telling you that they want to help you, that they're here to help. They're talking about your rights and their freedoms and so on. What would you ask them for? Would you ask them for money? Would you ask them for a new roof for your shack? Would you ask them for a toilet? Would you ask them for a job? Would you ask them for education? Would you ask them for another shot at the ovarian lottery? Um, or maybe, as the Ugandan journalist Andrew Mwanda put it, you'd be more philosophical and say, look, all I really want is an opportunity that I then have the chance to turn into an advantage. Something you do yourself from beginning to end. Something you see through. So I'm going to throw an argument at you tonight. You can definitely poke some holes in my argument, but that's okay. I want to provoke, provoke you a little bit. Um, and I want to start by saying we have a real empathy gap in our culture. A real empathy gap, especially when it comes to thinking about the global poor and people living in countries a world away. So, I'm a child of the 1980s. I grew up with images of Sally Struthers, swatting flies from the faces of emaciated children. Her ads were really inescapable. We were told to feel pity and sympathy. We were told that what we needed to do was spend a little money put it into, into her cause, put it into Africa to make a little bit of a difference. Of course, around this time we were hearing songs about how they don't know that there's Christmas in Ethiopia, that they have no running rivers over there, and again, we needed to just put some money into it to support that failing. What we were never told was to feel, to be empathetic, to walk in the shoes of another person, to walk in the shoes of these very different people in these very different societies, to understand their world and to see their reality, and then come back to this one right here and work to change this world so that we could change their world. We didn't learn that one. But make no mistake, global poverty comes right to our doorstep here in Santa Fe. We're all part of a vast global system. We're intimately connected cogs within a highly interconnected <coughs> world. There are only six degrees of separation, after all, between all of us. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is how all of us in this room are the future of international aid. We are the key to alleviating global poverty and ensuring that we can live in a world where there are basic rights, freedom, securities, and equal opportunities for one and all. It's a five-step plan, so bear with me. The first step, as often in peer-reviewed literature, is theoretical. So, first we're going to take the emphasis off the problems in poor countries and what's wrong with each one and the weaknesses of their institutions and their politicians and their corruption and so on. Instead, I want to encourage you to start thinking in systems. How do people act in big systems? <coughs> what leverage can we pull to change their behavior? What are the economic incentives from the small level to the big level that, that, that make people act? When we introduce an intervention, say um, a, a, a bed net to control malaria, when we introduce an intervention, how does it play out across the health system? And then how does it go beyond the system? What are the effects of those bed nets in, in terms of the intentional effects and the unintentional effects? What do we do when malaria bed nets are used as wedding veils or, or fishing nets? Or even more to the point, what do we do when this gift that we have given from our heart with our best meaning 
in the end ended up crushing the national industry trying to make a go <coughs> at making and distributing bed nets and making a profit out of it. So step one is we need to think in systems. When we start thinking in systems, we can increasingly connect the big ideas that we have with the millions of small actions that test those ideas, that refine those ideas, that reject them or improve them or deepen them. And with the sheer amounts of information and data we have at our fingertips nowadays, nothing can or should be done in isolation. So systems thinking is really the key, the blueprint for us to think comprehensively. So that's step one. Step two. Let's apply systems thinking to the aid industry itself. Because aid is, after all, really about systemic change. I think it's most helpful to pull up to a big macro level, as my previous presenters have done, and, and situate aid beside all the major economic interactions between rich and poor countries, <coughs> where aid is but one of several important dynamics. And when we do this, we see a whole tangle, a whole system of relationships between rich and poor. There's governments, there's multilaterals, there's bilaterals, there's foundations at the heart of the aid industry, along with corporations, remittances, tourism, and illicit financial flows, which I'll talk about in a second. So now let's apply some history and some economics to the systems analysis. And this allows us to come to the following soft yet pretty provocative conclusions. So, first, government to government or bilateral aid or multilateral aid or NGO-delivered aid or private foundation aid just really isn't working and never has. There are lots of success, success stories out there. You have all kinds of World Bank economists who will tell you about how Ghana and South Korea had the same GDP in 1957 and 30 years later South Korea had uh, amazing returns and Ghana was still where Ghana is now. Um, but this brand of aid really isn't working. This gift where we give money, we give expertise, we give training, um, it's a significant gift, but it's not getting the kinds of returns we should be expecting by now. We should be seeing thriving societies based on what the transfer of these things from north to south has been. But instead we see what the great Zambian thinker Dembi Samoyo has called, we see dead aid. Now, second, while certainly we give generously with one hand, we most certainly take back with the other. And then some. For reasons absolutely unknown to me, we permit uh, countries like Panama, countries like the British Virgin Islands, Switzerland, to operate a secret and shadowy banking system. In developing countries, the effect of this is huge. It facilitates corruption, it facilitates serious tax evasion, and it, and it encourages ultimately the flight of very scarce dollars on an extraordinary scale. All of this happening, of course, alongside the often very shady resource extraction deals between multinational corporations and national governments where the profits ultimately go, in the very short term, to the ruling elites, and on the long term, there's a great deal of pain for those developing countries. Some have said, and I'm, not, I'm going to say it, but it's not my opinion, and some have said that aid is essentially a smokescreen to, in, to continue the system of extraction where the global south essentially subsidizes the global north. I don't believe that, though. I, I want to look at it much more positively, which is step three. We need to start accepting, first of all, that we're at the end of the era where government is the sleek and shiny vehicle, driving innovation and driving social change. You can certainly argue against that, but the, f the fact is not enough of our best and brightest are going into government anymore. They're just not. And the incredibly divided politics that we see around the world right now are really limiting government's abilities to be innovative and to really step up and create sustainable um, evidence and experience for foreign policies and decisions. Government still has an incredibly important role to play in the world. It must create the support of conditions for wealth creation, ensuring, among other things, the rule of law and the preservation of human rights and freedom, securities, and opportunities. But government may be best placed as a more supportive role, what I'm calling the Camry role. <laughs> Reliable, secure, steady, leaving us to find systems innovation elsewhere, especially when it comes to aid. And fortunately, Innovation is the thing that this country truly specializes in, as best represented by the corporation. There's no better invention on planet Earth at turning an opportunity into an advantage, at employing huge numbers of people, at effectively and efficiently responding to customers with what they want, with precision. This is kind of tough to admit for the child of a social welfare state myself, but... <laughs> and I don't want to say that the corporation is the solution to global poverty. It's not. Let's go to step four. The answer to global poverty is not through the private sector as we know it now. 
the answer to global poverty is through the private sector that we used to know and that all of us in this room can help to build today and tomorrow. Anyone remember this movie? It was a big one. Released in 1987, I was 14, I remember it vividly. Wall Street, of course. The movie's power comes through the character, the brilliantly named Gordon Gecko, who told us that greed is good and money never sleeps. The money really captured the zeitgeist of the me decade through its portrait of the corporate raider, the man who aggressively buys and cuts up and then sells off pieces of corporations for a staggering profit for his shareholders. A couple years later, who could forget, Richard Gere, played a very similar role. And so during the Reagan years, we saw the rise of what's known as shareholder capitalism, which dominates to this day. As Jay Gilbert has put it, shareholder capitalism is a brilliant system because it has one very simple rule. And the rule is, it's in four words, maximize value for shareholders, period. You are accountable only to your shareholders, and your success is measured by the profit you generate for these shareholders. So it's a brilliant system, except for one small, tiny thing. There is no incentive or rule stipulating that corporations need to do anything beyond a very low minimum for the people they employ or serve, for the communities they operate in, or for the planet. And so, super predictably, this current model of capitalism leads corporations right into human rights abuses. Because what a profit you make when you employ children or you smash a labor union, and it leads them right into environmental degradation. Because again, what a tremendous profit you can make when you don't have to worry about your waste, and you don't really need to worry about the forest that you're planning to cut down. Shareholder capitalism is an antiquated system. It's super efficient, yes, but it serves the 1% pretty much exclusively and contributes to the incredibly damaging and growing income equality around the world. No longer works. Happily, the answer is an old answer. Stakeholder capitalism where corporations are accountable to workers, to the community, to the environment, along with their shareholders, of course. In a brief, this means corporations operating, among other things, with fully transparent supply chains, verified labor standards, and with sustainable and green environmental practices, ultimately serving the triple bottom line of profit, people, and planet. And what's really fascinating about this idea, and this is where I get to channel my inner Michael Moore, Stakeholder capitalism is an American idea from the 1950s when corporations had a much deeper and more comprehensive commitment to the workers they employed and to the communities they served. So, here's the payoff to all this. Here's step five, which I liken to the rug from the Big Lebowski. It's the thing that ties all this together, it makes all this happen. And the rug is really, it's you, it's me. It's all of us in this room because it's the American consumer who someone once called the donkey that pulls the world's economy, who will make the changes in the world. Because make no mistake, we as consumers in this country, we vote. We cast a ballot every time we open up our wallet and buy something. We're choosing one product, one service, and one good over another. So guess what we need to start doing? We have to stop supporting corporations that subvert policy processes, that engage in tax evasion, that promote corruption, or that act unethically. Full stop. Every time we shop, we must pause and ask, am I supporting the right kind of company or corporation? Happily, there are some shortcuts available to us. One's called the B Corporation, with B standing for benefit. If a corporation, corporation can pass a series of criteria around its energy use, its treatment of workers, its sustainability, and so on, then it's certified by an independent, nonprofit third party as B Corporation, and then they're entitled to put this logo on their products. And now you, the consumer, know that by purchasing a B Corporation product, you're making the right kind of decision, and you're supporting the right kind of corporate activity. So, we'll review our, our five steps quickly as we come back to the theme of the night, empathy. Empathy, as it turns out, sits right between conscious consumerism and global poverty. You could argue, in fact, that empathy is both the driver and the end goal of conscious consumerism. Empathy for the poor, empathy for the workers, empathy for the planet. Because when we start supporting the right kind of corporations, they make the right kind of decisions in both rich and poor countries. There's no more race to the bottom, no more incentive to find or create the labor conditions that allow them to pay a, a ridiculously low wage. They don't employ children. They are not allowed to have an opaque um, supply chain where they offload their practices to mysterious subcontractors and subsuppliers. 
they actively steward the environment, and they participate in the communities in which they're a part of. Now listen, when we shift the way corporations engage in poor countries, the people in those countries start getting opportunities. New jobs, new opportunities for wealth creation, new opportunities that have to fall within a global framework that also allows the corporations in poor countries to have access to our consumers through fair trade deals so that it's not just the corporations from rich countries that continually benefit, which as we have seen time and again contributes to things like instability and massive income uh, distribution problems. Ultimately, the poor do not want our charity. They don't want our pity. They're just like you and me. They want to turn opportunity into an advantage with hard work and good ideas. And the best part is Americans are old hat at that. Americans are outstanding at this. And now it's time for America's consumers and America's corporations to wake up and lead us into a new, bright, prosperous, responsible, and sustainable era for everybody. It's a super simple story. It's a simple argument. We live in the age of the corporation. It's long past time to reform and improve that key economic institution. We reform and improve things all the time across the society. It's what makes our society so special. The corporation's not immune from that. So it's a change that we can make if all of us, starting right now, start buying things in the right kind of way. And believe me, corporations are listening to us. They will change our practices if more and more of us demand it and are willing to pay for it. I don't know how many of you remember when Coke decided they were going to come out with new Coke and the incredible furor that, that resulted, even in Canada, and how quickly uh, Coke was to come out with classic Coke and the response. So what I want to say is we consumers have an incredible and a tremendous power to change the corporations that are the major economic agents in our world, in our world especially in the social media age. When we can let a preference be known, a beef be aired with a cl simple click or a swipe. So, we began with an empathy exercise, but I want to conclude with a challenge for you. Over the next week, I want you to stop and think about one consumer choice you're making. One. As you stop and think, why don't you pull out your phone? Do some research. Download the Seafood Watch app. Understand what the fish you're about to buy in the grocery store. Does it come from a sustainable fishery or not? Download the Bicot app so that you can learn about corporate practice, learn about where products come from, learn about where something was assembled and exactly how. Use Google, use Facebook, learn about the choices we have in front of us. Yes, we can buy products in seconds using our phones and what a, what a wonderful thing that is. But take your time when you shop. Choose wisely because every time you interact in the global economy with every transaction you make, you're having an effect on people around the world. Be conscious and use your dollars to cast that right, empathetic vote. This is a, a list of some of the corporations who are B, uh, B corporations certified. Uh, some recognizable names. There's also an absence of some of the much larger corporations on this, but it's a beginning. I want to conclude by saying these people, these humans who lost the ovarian lottery, they just don't want your charity. We need to feel empathy for them. And in response, we have to practice smart and sustainable economics. That's what we need to do. I'm not asking you to join a song circle and sing Kumbaya, although that's a, always a good choice. But I want you to recognize this is a tightly interconnected and interdependent globe. And I want you to support the corporations that uphold your values and reject the ones that don't. Because the opportunities put in front of a child like this depend in so many ways on how we spend our money.